When I was 12, the summer between seventh and eighth grades, a sudden realization struck such fright that I strove desperately to blot it out. Why not nothing? What if everything had forever been nothing? Not just emptiness, not just blankness, but not even the existence of emptiness, not even the meaning of blankness, and no forever. Lump together everything that exists and might exist, physical, mental, platonic, spiritual, God, everything. Call it all something. Why is there something rather than nothing? My whole life I've been haunted. Why does anything exist at all? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to finally find out. Maybe. I start on Mount Wilson, high above Los Angeles, where humanity's vision of the vastness of existence expanded enormously. I talk with John Leslie, one of my favorite living philosophers. His passion is explaining existence. John, the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Is this a legitimate question that we ask? I think it's a legitimate because it can have answers, even if you think that the answer is there just happens to be something, there might instead have been nothing, that's an answer. You could argue that all your views about the nature of the universe will, in the end, depend on whether the universe which you believe exists could have a reason behind its existence. I don't like the theory that the universe just happens to exist and just happens to have the characteristics which it does. Now, it would seem that nothing is, is simpler and, and, and should have been there rather than something. I think that's correct, but bear in mind that even in a blank there would be all sorts of facts. So if you try to imagine out of existence all actual things and say that's nothing, in a sense that's right, but also you've overlooked the fact that there's an infinite richness of truths about possibilities which is bound to exist even if no actual things exist. If there were a blank, it would still be true in this blank that if there were ever to exist two sets of two apples, then they would make four apples. And even if there was no possibility of them ever occurring? Even if there was no uh, Actuality. Re real possibility of their occurring, there would be no contradiction in their occur occurring. Their occurring would not be like the occurrence of a married bachelor. <laughs> and therefore, do you say that it is impossible for there to be a nothing without possibilities? I think that's so, and I think you can go further and say that, that um, there's an infinite number of possibilities and infinite number of facts about them, and they would be there even if there were no actual things forever and ever. But at the end of the day, we are still faced with this fundamental reality of dealing with this rich nothing versus our very specific something that we have to explain. Yes, I think there is this problem why we have an actual world instead of just a set of possibilities. To John, why is there something rather than nothing is the single most fundamental question. It cannot be addressed by science, but it can be analyzed, if not answered, by philosophy. This is the domain of metaphysics. 
Peter van Inwagen, a philosopher at Notre Dame, specializes in metaphysics. He has thought long and hard about this seemingly impossible question. His claim is that progress is possible. Peter, the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is perhaps the most fundamental, deepest, most difficult question that I can conceive of. It seems like there's no progress we can make on such a, a question. Now, what can we say about that? Well, let's think about it. Now, one sort of answer that you might give uh, would be that it was impossible for there to be nothing. There have been two attempts at this in the history uh, of philosophy. One is summed up under the name the ontological argument, and the other under the name the cosmological argument. The ontological argument is generally seen as a proof for the existence of God. But it also answers our question because, of course, if God exists, then it's false that nothing exists. If God has to exist, um, then uh, it's true that it's impossible for there to be nothing. The cosmological argument uh, is also seen as an argument for the existence of God. It tries to show this. If there is a world around us that looks as this world is, then in the background there mustn't be a being who couldn't fail to exist. But since we see that there is uh, a world around us like this, then we can see uh, that there is in the background uh, a being who couldn't fail to exist. So in a sense that argument shows uh, that if there is something, then it's impossible uh, for there to be nothing. I don't find uh, either of them um, convincing myself. Another way of answering the question, however, you think of all the possible ways uh, that the world might be. And we mean a total possibility for the world, not in every detail. All these seem to be equally probable. Um, and the probability of all of them seems to be zero. And yet one of them happened. Well, what could differentiate one way for there to be nothing from another way for there to be nothing? There's only one way for there to be nothing, and it's a total state of affairs. That is, it settles everything. Uh, every proposition uh, has its truth value settled, true or false, usually false, uh, by there being nothing. So if we're right that it's one way for the reality to be and all ways, total ways for reality to be are equally probable and it's all zero, then the probability of there being nothing is zero. Some people would answer this question very glibly and say, God that there is something because God created it. Well, either God is a necessary being or he's not a necessary being. If he's a necessary being, then there isn't, even, there isn't any possibility of there being nothing. If God is a contingent being, then we still uh, have the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Because one of the possible ways for there to be is there's nothing, not even God. If God is a contingent being, that's just to say, explain, wh answer the question, why there's a physical world or something right, like right, that, right, not right. why is there something rather than right, nothing. Right. So at the end of the day, what do you feel in your guts to the answer to that question? I think um, God exists and that God is a necessary being, uh, and therefore it's not possible for there to be nothing. Peter argues that because there are an infinite number of potential worlds, each specific world would have a zero probability of existing. And because nothing is only one of these potential worlds, there is only one kind of nothing, therefore the probability of nothing is zero. But the prior probability of nothing may not be the same as other possible ways the world might have been. Isn't nothing different, simpler? In that all other worlds would require something more. As for God being the answer, I need to go to Oxford to meet Bede Rundle, 
an atheistic philosopher who wrote a book that turns my question into a statement. Why there is something rather than nothing. Why indeed? Bede, when I was 12 years old, I was lying in bed one night, and suddenly I had this thought, what if there were nothing? And it so panicked me. I forced myself to put it out of my mind. It, it frightened me so much. It, it's a fascinating one because it seems impossible at first uh, blush to give any sort of coherent answer. As uh, you no doubt know, it, it's, it's had a longish history. It started off with Leibniz and uh, many major philosophers have uh, tried their hand at giving an answer. Perhaps the major worked out answers to be found in someone like St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. So his answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, was, well, there is God and God has to exist. He exists of necessity. But perhaps a, a prior question is, clearly if someone says, why is there something rather than nothing, they think that there being nothing is a genuine alternative. And the question, we've got to explain why we have one alternative realised rather than the other. I'm inclined to agree with the general position that there has to be something or other, but the theistic solution seems to me to have its difficulties. Many of the difficulties centre around this slippery term, nothing. Mm. Suppose I say to you, there's nothing between these two bodies. Now, you might take that in two ways. You might say, well, in that case, they must be touching. <laughs> or you might say, and perhaps this is the more natural one, there's just empty space. OK. Now, which one are we interested in? I think it's the first one. That's the literal sense of there being nothing, because space is not nothing. You can travel through space. You speak of the depths of space and, and so forth. You can measure a space. So now we've got to consider whether there could be nothing in the literal sense. Yeah. Take, take this idea, there being nothing, and then the universe coming into being or beginning to exist. Now. Does that make sense? Could there be a preceding state of affairs of there being nothing, which gives way to a state of affairs where there's something? Well, what are the conditions in which you can speak of something as beginning to exist? Isn't it that there has to be a time when it doesn't exist, followed by a time when it does exist? But if you don't have anything at all, then you don't have time. So it doesn't make sense to think of an antecedent state of affairs of nothing being followed by something. So perhaps we ha just have to confront it as a brute fact that there is something. You can't get beyond that. There's no explaining it. And that's that. But, but that's just incredibly not satisfying. I mean, is it just a defect of, of, of a human mind or my own, you know, incapacity or immaturity? To say br brute fact, it, it just seems that that's not enough. Well, if it's if it's a conceptual truth <clears throat> that th there is something, if there has to be something, then that's an end to your agonising, surely. And if you could refute all the arguments that say, well, we can make sense of a state of affairs in which there's nothing at all, then, of course, the, uh, the problem is still with you. Bede believes that there must be something or other. There cannot be nothing. Nothing is an impossible state of affairs. Is this progress or word games? I can't decide. Nothing still shadows me. God could close off debate, but I'm not ready for God. I am ready for Quentin Smith, a painter and a poet and an atheistic philosopher who is consumed by the riddle of existence. Quentin, if there is any question that has haunted me my entire life, it is why not nothing, why is there something rather than nothing. Is it even possible to make progress in answering this question? I think so. The first thing is to recognize that when people have tried to answer it, they have defined nothing 
as this very thin sort of something, like empty space, quantum vacuum, um, someone called it the null set. But this is really nothing, absolutely nothing forever. Not, not even the concept of nothing. Okay, and I think a good way to describe it as not something. So the question is, why is it the case that it is false that there is not something? Well said. Okay, now th there is an answer to that, but it's very trite and trivial. The answer would be this. Right now, this is a state of the universe. It is something. So why does this something exist? Well, it was caused to exist by the previous state of the universe, okay. which is also something, and that was caused by a previous state, which in turn is something. And if you ask why there is something at all, I can just confine myself to one example, this state of the universe. Then the answer is a previous state of the universe caused it to exist. But there's no reason why this whole package, this sequence of states, had to exist rather than not this. It would seem to be more uh, simple, more logical, and less to explain if there really were nothing, not something. I'm not sure uh, simple and less to explain <laughs> makes sense. You're talking about not something. What makes the answer difficult is that the answer is so obvious and trivial and, and we're so used to expecting it to be a, a grand answer. I don't mean this to be insulting, but your answer is not very satisfying. Well, I found that insulting. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do you find your own answer satisfying? Uh, yes. You do? Yes, although... You look, uh, you look pretty content. Uh, well, it took me a while to recover from the disappointment <laughs> after I first realized that's the answer. And I said, I spent all my life wondering why there's something or nothing, and this is the answer. <laughs> I love Quentin's passion. He contends that while no thing existing might have been the case, some things existing is the case. And the reason is trivial. Each and every thing was caused by a prior thing. That can't be the answer, but might it? I want to scream. Why not nothing? Every time I return to it, it drives me nuts. To conclude, I consider God, and then no God. In each case, why not nothing? For the theistic view, I go to Richard Swinburne, a leading theistic philosopher. Richard is the author of The Existence of God, perhaps the most influential modern book suggesting that God's existence is more likely than not. Richard, when we think of why there is anything, it is a natural human inclination, if you really think deeply about it, to think there is nothing more astonishing, nothing, than there is something, that nothing would have been the most logical possibility. I share that intuition. It is extremely puzzling. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Well, all explanation consists in trying to find something simple and ultimate from which every, on it, which everything else depends. And uh, I think that that simple and ultimate, which we can get to by rational inference, is God. But um, it's not logically necessary that there should be a God. Um, the supposition there is no God contains no contradiction. Nor is it the case that there is a God because it's good there should be a God and the good uh, necessarily comes into existence. This principle of explaining the existence of something because it's good, not because some 
good person designed it, but because it's good in itself, is a principle which we do not recognize in other fields as a kind of explanation at all. We explain things in by scient in scientific way, by laws and initial conditions, or by the actions of persons in virtue of their purposes. So uh, there is no explanation of why there is a God, and it would be theologically problematic, as it were, if you were to say, well, as a matter of fact, it's logically necessary that there's a God, because that would mean that the existence of God depended on some principle of logic which was somehow superior to God. Mm. If God explains everything else, then he wouldn't be God if there was an explanation of his existence. And uh, he is the ultimate truth, which we, uh, that's how it is. We, we can't go further than that. For the atheistic view, I go to Steven Weinberg, a Nobel laureate and leading atheistic scientist. Steve's insights into the nature of reality should be known by everyone on Earth. Steve, why is there something, anything, rather than nothing? That is just the kind of question that uh, we will be stuck with when we have a final theory. Because whatever our theory is, no matter how mathematically consistent and logically consistent the theory is, there will always be the alternative that, well, perhaps there's nothing at all. In modern physics, you can say the idea of empty space without anything at all is inconsistent with the principles of quantum mechanics, that the uncertainty principle doesn't allow a situation of empty space where the fields are zero and they're not changing, they're always zero. But the question gets down to what is, what is quantum, why do you have yeah, quantum exactly. mechanics? Exactly. That doesn't answer the question. Why do we live in a world governed by those laws? And the, we will never have an answer to that. Does that bother you? Yes, I would like to have an answer to everything, but I've gotten used to it. I do think that as we learn more and more about the universe, we see that there's no point in the laws of nature that refers specifically to human beings. There's nothing that gives us guidance. But if we don't find a point in nature, we can at least make a point for ourselves. We can love each other and find beauty in things. I think the position of human beings uh, is uh, eternally rather tragic, that we uh, have no guidance, we have no script. We're not acting out a part in a cosmic drama. Uh, facing this essential tragedy, we can leaven it uh, with a certain sense of humor. Uh, about our condition and get some, even some pleasure out of being able to face the tragedy of our position without actually whining about it. Why the universe? Does God exist? Both questions forget. Why anything at all? That's the ultimate question. Wouldn't it have been simpler if there had always been nothing rather than always something? I've come to only two kinds of answers. The first is that there is no answer. Existence is a brute fact without explanation. The second is at the primordial beginning, something was self-existing. The essence of this something was its existence, such that non-existence to it would have been as inherently impossible as physical immortality to us is factually impossible. Candidates for self-existence include matter energy and space-time. 
natural laws of physics or higher order laws that generate quantum mechanics and perhaps multiple universes. Forms of consciousness, cosmic or otherwise. A creator God or an ultimate cause beyond the physical. Some overarching principle or value like Plato's The Good. Why is there something rather than nothing? If you don't get dizzy, you really don't get it. This is Closer to Truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.